Uh, he came to London because uh, he was he had an affair with this guy Ian Somerville, who was um, a mathematician who was still at uh, studying at Cambridge. And so uh, at the end of the summer, Ian came back to London, and uh, Bill simply followed him. And for the first few years, they stayed in various hotels, in mainly in um, Earl's Court. And then in 67, I think it was, uh, he rented a place on uh, Duke Street St. James and um, lived there until 74. So he was there for quite a long time. And Fortnum and Mason's was his corner shop and uh, where he'd go and get his milk and his, um, his sal salted crackers that he had for lunch. He said, I enjoy a salted cracker. He said, That's, uh, <laughs> and then he ate out every single evening. I mean, he was, he's from that kind of generation who never cooked for themselves. You know. So he was living the sort of proper, you know, St. James's Gentleman's Club sort of life. You know, was, uh, you know he used to have boys, boyfriends from Piccadilly, Dilly boys. and. Uh, and you know, live the proper life of a gentleman. Through the books, I learned about Burroughs, and then I met people who had actually met him. You know that he actually was in, you know, living at the Beat Hotel in Paris, and then these were people uh, when I went to art college who. who you know, actually went to Paris. I mean, astonishing to me. You know, and and I'd met him and stayed in the hotel, which was very very cheap and rat infested. Um, and then Naked Lunch appeared. Uh, it was published in 1959, and I got a copy probably within six months of it being published, and it just blew me away. I just thought this really tells it like it is. You know, and I'd been you know for English O levels, you know, it was sort of Siegfried Sassoon and all these kind of things is what we were reading in Dickens, you know. And I'd never I had no idea people could write like this. It was brilliant. Well somehow somehow or other I got hold of Burroughs' address in Tangier. He was he, that's where he was living at the time. And um, so I was bringing out a little magazine and um, I thought it'd be nice to Published something of his, so I literally just wrote to him. In this would have been in the summer of 1964, and I got back this big letter and a, a three or four page manuscript. It was absolutely brilliant, and so we had a correspondence. I mean, about really obscure stuff. I mean, he he was into uh, Wilhelm Reich's uh, organ accumulators at the time, and uh, we had a conversation, a, a correspondence about whether or not magnetized ones would work better, and this that kind of stuff. Then when he, he came to Britain in at the end of 65, September 65, I think, and by then I, I already knew Ian Somerville, oddly enough, who was his boyfriend. And, um, and in fact, Ian eventually had a room in a, in a house I was renting in Westminster. So, um, so I, I started, I basically I moved into his sort of social circle and first met him in 65. And then, then I did a lot of work with him over the years. So when I started International Times with Hoppy, uh, we got Burroughs to write for the second issue, the third, the fifth, you know, the eighteenth. I mean, he was in, you know, if Bill had something to say, he, you know, he would just give it to us and we would run it. And then the Underground Press Syndicate would syndicate it all over the world. And uh, he loved that, the fact that stuff could be out so, so quickly. And the other person he, he was hanging out with was Brian Geisen, who was an old friend and collaborator of his, and uh, they worked on the cut-ups together. And in, in the end, in fact, uh, Brian moved over into the same building. So Anthony and Brian and, um, and Bill lived in, in 22 Duke Street St. James. And also did, so did Eric Burden from The Animals. And so it was, um, it's not a very big building, so it was a bit of a sort of cool building to, to, to be in. And, uh, um, and then he knew a lot of the Chelsea set. He knew Christopher Gibbs and he knew the uh, Robert Fraser, the art dealer. He, he was quite friendly with Robert and spent a lot of time at his place. Um, he moved in mainly gay circles, actually. Uh, but he also, uh, he, since he ate in Soho almost every evening, uh, he got to know the people at the Colony Room pretty well and, uh, and the French pub. So he knew um, Francis Bacon. Although he, he actually first met Bacon in Tangier. But um, I used to go with him occasionally to, to meet Francis, in the, mainly in the colony, which is where Francis Bacon hung out most of the time. So it was, um, it was interesting, sort of a mixture of sort of 
um, you know, gay people, gangsters, artists. Um, Junkies? Hmm? Junkies? I don't think he was on junk most of the time he was in Britain, so he didn't really mix with a sort of junky set. I mean, not that there was much. I mean, apparently uh, by the end of the 60s, there were only 200 registered addicts in the entire country. In fact, Burroughs um, had a doctor who also wrote him a script for marijuana, which um, was a much more complicated thing. He, he, was, he, <laughs> he would go to the doctor and he would say, I'm, I'm really feeling very, very paranoid um, about being busted because I smoke marijuana. So this is a cure for paranoia. So he would sign, <laughs> give him a script for uh, tincture of cannabis, which comes in a, a liquid suspension of, uh, of alcohol. And it's, dyed, it's bright green. And Bill used to dip his senior service cigarettes into it. And, and, uh, you know, and he would light up in restaurants. And he was convinced nobody had noticed. But he's smoking this bright green cigarette, which like, really smelled very strong indeed. You know? <laughs> but he looked so straight you know, in his suit and everything. And, you know... They, you know, no one ever did anything about it. Everywhere Burroughs lived, he never really noticed the city at all. I mean, he, as far as I know, he never went to an art gallery or, or a film or anything. I mean, his, his life was cerebral. It was all, all in his head. You know, his characters came to him, half of them in dreams. Um, he, liked, he liked the sort of popular press, you know. Um, he would get you know, funny clippings and stuff and use them in collages and um, he liked, um, later on in the early 70s, uh, he had a great big colour television which he, he had turned right up so that the red was, was really strong and he particularly liked the riots in Belfast and stuff like that. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, he, but he could have been anywhere, you know, and he, when he was in Paris he loved it and then eventually he hated it and he moved to London and he loved it and then eventually he hated it. New York, same thing, Tangier, same thing. Yeah, yeah. When he was living in London, he produced uh, the Wild Boys, um, the Exterminator, uh, the Ticket That Exploded. No, no. Well, some of Ticket That Exploded was written here. Um, yeah, he, he he produced a lot, and he did a lot of uh, collages and uh, scrapbooks where he combined text and images, and uh, he worked on the, a lot of films with Anthony Bolsch, Towers Open Fire, Cut Ups were, were both made in London, and. Um, and he did a lot of tape collages as well, and, you know, cut up tapes where he would record a, a text and then rewind, and go through it and just punch in and read it from newspaper clippings and things like that. Often themed, there would be something like uh, he'd have a big folder of news clippings about um, bus plunges, for instance, you know, or, in, <laughs> or um, you know, or the number 23, 23 dead in air crash, you know, 23 dead in a riot and stuff. And uh, he had all these things he would read out from in this gravelly voice, you know. <laughs> and uh, they, were, they were really, um, I liked them a bit. A lot of people find them very difficult li listening. Some years ago, I produced a three volume, a, th a three CD box set of them, uh, which uh, uh, I have to say can clear a room pretty fast, actually. <laughs> but I, yeah, I quite enjoy them. So he finally moved back to the States after he left in 1947 uh, or 48, I think, and went back in 74. So he produced almost all of his work uh, while living abroad in, in Mexico or South America or Tangier or Paris and, or London. So um, uh, he basically went home. And then after New York, he went to, to back to the Midwest, not to, not to um, Missouri, where he came from, but to Kansas, which is the next state and lived quietly with his cats like an old man should. Mm -hmm.